All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I was looking through the room um, and uh, I saw a lot of familiar names that I remember even like, like Greg said, you know, last, I think a year ago was the last time I was in the USCS one. And then I also see some new names as well, but I'm sure everyone here is very, very strong. Um, all right, super quick introduction. Uh, uh, for those of you guys who haven't um, uh, met me before, my name is Alex, Alex Ostrowski. I'm an international master uh, living in New York. And um, I mean, that's all you really got to know. Uh, I have done a lot of these before. I think maybe I've given like 20 or more of these classes, but not recently. So it's always good to be back. And uh, I've, I've played some of you guys too, I recognize in the, we got, and then we got, Famous Rio. I wonder how his microphone is doing. He had a very famous microphone last I remember, but we'll see. Um, anyway, let's get to some chess. So um, I wanted to share, you know, keep it kind of relatively simple for myself. Um, and uh, recently I've been, you know, Greg saying I've been organi organizing tournaments. I've been trying to play in them too. Uh, so personally, I have, um, I, have, I have one Grandmaster Norm. So obviously, uh, the dream is one day to get a couple more. Uh, but uh, so I used to be very, very active. I was like 24, 50 fide. Um, you know, I, I had the norm. I still have that norm. They haven't taken it away yet. We'll see. Maybe maybe they will if I if I play quite poorly. But I still have a norm. So very frequently, uh, I still play these nine round events. Uh, I know a lot of people here uh, also play them. Some of you, uh, some of you guys have even played like in in Charlotte. Um, so those nine round events, I think Rio actually, congratulations, just got his first norm. So one thing I want to share with you, uh, a couple of games that I recently played, and uh, I wanted to share sort of my experience in playing these tournaments, especially for those of you who are either have been participating in them or are thinking of participating in them. And uh, of course, you know, more over than that, I just want to give you a little bit of glimpse into potentially you know, some things that I like to do for preparation or some things that I think are important for everyone, I think. And to some degree to do in your preparation. And of course, also I try to pick out some relatively interesting or educational moments from the from the games. Um, okay, so I see that there's there's a lot of things in the in the chat here, but I'm going to try to keep an eye here. Most of it looks like nonsense, but when we do have some real uh, chess questions, you guys can message me about that. I'll try to answer. Okay, I want to take you guys through uh, hopefully four games. We'll you know give or take, maybe a little less or more. This is from a tournament that I played a couple months ago. It was like I mentioned a nine round, uh, nine round round robin uh, where all the players play each other. You need a certain score to get a norm. Uh, like I said, I know some of you have played there. Some of you may be considering in the future. In general, these events are quite nice because you play a really strong opponent every round. So um, obviously, playing a Swiss tournament is also great. But here, you're kind of guaranteed. You know, for me, for example, you know, I'm playing an international master or a grandmaster every round. So even if I'm not necessarily doing you know super great to get my norm i can still you know still get a good game every every round still try to put on some points so for that reason i think that that's kind of the benefit of playing those tournaments but anyway in this game i'm playing um um uh, jason liang who's um or he also used to be maybe he still is in these uh in these zoom calls quite a lot very strong player of course also an international master and uh, one thing i want to before we jump into the first move of the game one thing i want to also kind of discuss as like i mentioned preparation um, the way that it works for these tournaments also, and um, this goes for everyone here regardless, you know, if you're playing these uh, long time patrol tournaments, whether they're Swisses or round robins, um, a lot of times you actually have a chance to potentially prepare for your opponent. Uh, you know, you get the pairings early, obviously these tournaments, you get them in advance. Uh, so, you know, but even if you're playing, you know, um, some different event, they could be coming out uh, an hour or, or two hours, or if you're lucky, a day before, uh, and you can have a look at your opponent. And uh, of course, nowadays, I think, Compared to, you know, I became an international master at this point almost 10 years ago. And uh, compared, you know, so I can I can sound like an old man now because I can talk about, oh, back in my day, um, 10, uh, 10 years ago, uh, when I was playing, you know, my events, getting my norms, the level of preparation for for my opponents was was like much, um, much lower because we didn't really have, I think, as much access to all the stuff that you guys are using today, you know, like all these chessable courses or just in general, like all these videos and books. Um, it just wasn't that common back then. So nowadays, 
there's all this information. It's just a question of how much time are you going to be uh, devoting to studying those things, and um, ha, you know, and if you're kind of choosing the the right concept. So um, anyway, get, getting back to the to to the present situation, when you know I'm in this tournament, I'm looking at you know what my opponents play. They're looking at what I play. Uh, this becomes a little bit of a cat and mouse game, and um, you know, we'll start with the game. I play C4. Now, normally, uh, I'm actually uh, an E4 player, but one very, very important thing in general is, especially nowadays, like I mentioned, because there's so much possibilities uh, to, you know, for people to prepare, it's, you know, you can't really, um, you know, it's really, really hard to truly surprise someone. And um, and um, one, one, I think, really useful thing to do, this obviously very, very general, and uh, is, is to have multiple openings, right? And I think, uh, 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 for me, like actually I played E4 my, almost my entire life. It wasn't until I was, uh, I mean, I think three years ago. So I was already like, you know, in my, in my 20s, uh, I actually learned, you know, C4 from, from, uh, from scratch and I added E4 and C4. So one other thing that I uh, also noticed, for example, was this is uh, more and more true, of course, for a lot of players. But one thing I, I, I thought was interesting, Abhimanyu, who I, of course, all you guys know, um, he, was a, he was a grandmaster and uh, youngest grandmaster of all time. He was someone who was always very, very well prepared. And I've played him many times when he was playing the round robin events, but he was always kind of playing the same exact line. So he was very predictable in his openings. But when it comes to these tournaments, when people are preparing against you, even if you know your line super duper well, if someone knows they're coming every round, it can be kind of, um, you know, not really that big of an advantage. So I noticed that when he started getting his norms, all of a sudden, of course, he improved in many, many ways, I'm sure. But one of the things that I noticed was all of a sudden, you know, he went from always playing E4 to then playing D4. And then versus E4, he used to play um, always, I think he was always like a Nagarov player. And I saw he was playing some games in the French. He was playing some games. Um, I think he saw him play a Dragon at one point. So he started playing all these uh, other openings that he had, I think, never played before. And that obviously is a, a tremendous amount of work to learn all those all those lines. But one of the key things about learning uh, these new, new types of uh, openings is that you're really expanding your knowledge of all sorts of different positions. And that just improves your chess, uh, chess abilities as a whole. Okay, big speech. Let's get to the game. So C4, E6, Knight of 3, D5. I played E3. Um, um, so we'll fast forward a little bit through the opening. If you guys have some questions, like I said, if you put them in the chat, I'll try to, I'll try to answer them. Uh, but um, all right, we have this English, uh, English opening type, uh, type position. And um, one thing, uh, I'll fast forward a little bit. Uh, so one thing I also want to add when it comes to doing your preparation, right? How, how, you know, how are you, uh, how do I handle that? How do you guys handle that? Of course, as I mentioned, there's all these different resources, uh, uh, such as, um, you know, like I mentioned, like the chess courses are pretty big. Um, obviously there's also like different types of, you know, there's probably even things that I might not uh, mention or know about, uh, you know, just online courses in general, um, or, you know, books, of course, still viable and more than ever, you also have access to engines and databases. And uh, of course you can use those things as well. So uh, this particular line, I also want to kind of bring up this uh, this variation, just not only because uh, you guys will see that we'll have some decent moments in the game. So I want to bring this game up from a, from a standpoint of uh, preparing for opponents and preparing openings. Now, this was actually the last round of the tournament. I wasn't playing for Norm, he wasn't playing for Norm. So, you know, it turns the last round, things get a little bit lazy. People are like, oh, okay, I've already played so much chess. So I kind of went into this game. I didn't look at anything specific. This was just things that like I had looked at once upon a time. And uh, also Jason, for example, he's someone who plays many different lines. I, this is like my third game as white against him. And the first time I played E4, he played the Karakhan. Second time I played E4, he played the uh, the Sicilian. So he plays a lot of different things. So that's why, like I said, very, very early on, if you're someone who plays many different openings, um, it becomes very, very hard to prepare for you, but it also becomes very useful to your own chess abilities because then you're uh, expanding your arsenal of weaponry and you can kind of choose it depending on the opponent you're playing. And on top of that, you can also, um, of course, enrich your own chess, uh, chess education, chess knowledge. Personally, for me, a lot of times when I would go throughout my chess playing history and I would, um, you know, have a jump in my level, it would be... Um, it would be uh, like a lot of time coincided with me learning some new kind of uh, opening. Um, not always, but that was something that was uh, that was useful. Uh, and that's actually a good question. So uh, Joshua messaged me. He says, "What rating would you think is best to learn multiple openings?" And yeah, that's actually something I should should also touch upon because I'm not saying, okay, look, you know, you're 1500, fantastic, six openings, and then you know, go go and get there, go go out and get it. Obviously, you know, you want to have a good sort of base, you know, whatever, you know, maybe you're an E4 or D4 player. Great. You know, you want to know what you're doing there. 
um, uh, to, to start things off, you don't need to immediately start off shooting into all sorts of different lines um, or whatever, if you play something with black. But, um, you know, once you've kind of been playing some, some particular opening, I would say, I mean, I don't have a super scientific answer here. I would say, you know, maybe like play something for like over a year, two years, you know, year and a half, two years. That's probably a good moment to um, to add something additionally to, to your repertoire, just because like for me, at least. Um, a lot of times when I, obviously there's a benefit. If you play something a lot, you become very proficient in it. Hopefully you gain a lot of experience in the arising structures, which is an important um, addition to your game as well. But at the same time, um, a lot of times the benefit also, at least for me, when I play something new, it makes it makes it a lot uh, less stale, a lot more interesting to play. So for me, you know, if I'm playing something for, like, there's openings that I've been playing for like 10 years, but in general, you know, if it's been like a couple of years and then I, uh, you know, I usually try to, add some different things, um, things on to, to the repertoire, but you know, it's, uh, at what rating specifically, I mean, I think once you're beyond, um, you know, expert for sure, which I think is everyone here, you know, and especially if you've been playing something for a very long time, you know, you, it is a good idea generally to, to learn additional things. Um, on top of that, I should also say, you know, you also want to make sure the thing you're currently playing is, is, is adequate as well, because you might have learned an opening when you were like 1200 and you're just playing that opening for like the next 800 points of your, of your, uh, existence. And if you kind of still, you know, haven't improved on that knowledge, then, you know, you may not even need to learn anything new. You need to learn your own current stuff. Now, with that being said, I want to turn on the online base here. And, okay, I'm sure everyone uh, knows of this feature if you use ChessBase or any other sort of a sort of a program or online base, I guess. Um, it's also a good idea, you know, whenever you analyze your games or analyze some opening, you want to see what other um, uh, other players are doing it. Okay, obviously, I'm, I, I'm assuming you guys all, all know this. But one thing I was also going to add, especially nowadays, one, one thing that I try to especially do, um, not only do I try to, uh, when, you know, when I'm preparing my openings, obviously, I use, um, I use you know, like I mentioned, like uh, the engines and databases and, and, and other written resources. It's actually also important to look at what your, uh, you know, what your opponents could be looking at. So, you know, in this particular case, um, I don't know, does anyone... Uh, you know, I haven't asked a question in a while, but I'm curious. Does anyone play this variation for black? Uh, this, this is a semi slot. Does anyone play this for black? You guys can. Okay, we got a one me. Someone admits it. All right. So, okay, if you don't play it, that's okay. You know, I'm not saying, you know, I, it's, uh, I'm just curious. Do you, do you play this? Okay, now let me ask another question. If you play this with black, I think, you know, there's one resource that comes to my mind, at least, and this is something that I looked at because I knew my opponents could be using it. If you are someone who plays this line for black, and maybe you even know, even if you don't play it for black, what is a resource that I'll, that let's uh, what is a good resource on this opening for black? It's a specific course I'm thinking about, and I am sure you guys know it. Um, well, someone gave me a move. I'm not asking for a move. I'm asking for a, you know, yeah, exactly. Someone so exactly. Someone messages. Okay, multiple people have messages. Yeah. So there is, for example, there's a Sam Shanklin lifetime course here. On on and on chessable, for example, and um, that is something you can expect that a lot of players are going to use. You know, doesn't if, if you're playing this for white. So there are certain sort of um, resources that are very popular. You know, some top player publishes. You know, here's my analysis on the um, you know semi slav slav whatever opening. You can bet that the suggestion in that line is going to be used against you. So it's it's also important to. Uh, in conclusion, it's important to also understand what your opponents are looking at, even if you don't like I don't play this for black at all, but I was aware of the course and I was aware of the suggestions uh, in it, because, you know, when I'm doing my preparation, I want to know what, what the other guy is preparing as well. So that's something important. So anyway, this type of position, exactly regardless if you play it or not, we have this, uh, it's called the semi slot, very solid structure for black. Uh, for now, this bishop is a little bit passive. Uh, white's plan is to break with e4 at a, at a good moment, and black wants to play e5 or c5. So I go rook d1, he goes rook d8. These are all moves that have been seen. I'll, I'll leave this on for now. Rook e1, he goes rook e8. Now bishop f1. Again, uh, both sides are looking for a good moment to break through in the center. So there's a decent amount of tension in the position. Obviously, I'm looking for a moment. If I can play e4 and then uh, have a, I mean, let, let's give black like a move that's probably not very good, like a6. That move doesn't make really a lot of sense. Hasn't been played before, though. So for example, like, you know, there could be a position like this where, uh, Black is having some troubles uh, playing this uh, c5 move. And then, of course, at the same time, I have more space in the center. Knight f6, maybe there's queen c2, maybe there's queen h4. Uh, I'm not sure which of those are stronger. But black is really struggling to play c5 because here, for example, d5 can be played. Looks like there's a random game. I don't know how, why black played a6 in that game. I guess that's what happened. 
Uh, but it looks like this uh, 2350 player stumbled into this very difficult position. There's knight g5, there's this pin. Just an example of white, what white is uh, going for here. Obviously, a6 is a really goofy move for black. So yeah, white's looking for a good moment to play e4. Black, on the other hand, has to play e5 or c5. Now, here's the thing. So in the game, uh, Jason plays the move e5. And uh, you know, if we look at the statistics here, um, you have e5 and c5. First of all, those are the national moves that you need to be checking for black. Second of all, um, even though c5 is more popular, I don't pay a lot of attention to this, but it is interesting to see, you know, I see this move e5, and I paid special attention to it, not only because it's a popular move, but also because the score, and you should know this score is always from uh, from white's perspective. So, you know, 54%, uh, 44% means uh, black, uh, white is scoring uh, 44. That's obviously very bad. Black is, for some reason, scoring, you know, better than 50% in the opening. So that kind of means either this line is amazing or, you know, something's going on here. And I actually kind of want to share something kind of funny with you guys. So my opponent plays e5 here. And, okay, obviously I'm aware of this move. You've always got to be aware of the dangerous moves in your repertoire. And uh, in this position, I take an e5. There's this really uh, cool line here, and I'll just share for fun, that um, if you take on d5 uh, with white, black has this really aggressive move e4, and uh, there's this like really crazy forced line. Perhaps some of you who play this for black know about this one. So there's like takes, takes, I think it goes takes, and then uh, black goes check here, check, and um, there's this like really big attack. And um, okay, if the king, if there's like g3 or king h1, I think there's knight g4, and then there's also queen h6 ideas. And um, yeah, if you guys, and then I think the move is like if king h3, there's like rookie five, some really goofy stuff like this. Looks like people are like, hey, we, we, we saw this, we saw this, we saw this. Yeah, okay, nope, that's, yeah, I didn't know you guys saw this. Uh, I, you know, this is just something that, it didn't happen in my game. I did not lose this way, but looks as you guys know, if, for those of you who don't know, this wins because of this beautiful idea where we sag the rook to get the queen into the square. Looks like everyone already knows it. See, everyone is so smart. Everyone's so well prepared. But I'm also, was a little bit smart in this game, and I did not uh, did not lose that way. So I took an e5, my opponent took, and here I played uh, knight to d4. Now, again, going along with, uh, uh, you know, the topic of, you know, preparing this specific opening, this was not something that I prepared uh, for this game, as I mentioned, but again, you know, you got to know the main lines when you're playing these, these, these positions. And I paid special attention to this variation here because I was like, wait, this is like, this has this really cool idea for black. This also has like um, this really... Uh, you know, um, well, good score. So those are some things that I, I, I try to look at when I'm considering what my opponents could play. But I'm also trying to keep the same in reverse. So for example, I, in the game, I played knight d4. Now, as you guys will see, the most common move is knight e5, bishop e5, then it takes, takes, knight to b5, and um, rook c8, queen b1, and now bishop to b8. So this position here uh, has been reached seven times. I think these are mostly correspondence games, but, um, you know, I look at this position, uh, yeah, G3 here or whatever. And um, yeah, you know, you can see the score. Uh, you have a lot of these games where white and black are kind of evenly matched by rating. Uh, actually, white's like maybe even, I don't know, whatever. Let's just call it evenly matched. And somehow, you know, it's all draws and one win for black. And so, you know, even though white has this outpost, looks like black has a lot of activity with the knight coming to E4. So I looked at this position, it's like around equal. And I was like, mm, okay, this is like maybe not what I want to do. So again, instead of kind of going for the most common move, in the game, I played the move uh, knight to d4. Now, um, you know, after the game, I I talked with my opponent. You know, we analyzed a little bit, and uh, this whole idea that I, that I'm about to, that I that I played in the game, he told me he was like, oh, like he, he, we had some discussion about the game, and uh, he he, uh, he was like, yeah, like um, you know, like I was thinking blah 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 blah, and I was like, yeah, you know, that was actually uh, preparation. He was like, oh, okay, I didn't realize that, but okay, so he takes on c4. Now the whole point, you know, why do people not play knight d4? This looks really obvious. You're going to get this fork. You're going to be able to take on d5. All these good things. Well, the reason people don't do this uh, is because, well, the people maybe people the reason maybe people don't do this is because after knight f5, uh, you get the bishop, but you actually uh, in this position, you actually have to give up a pawn. So you know, if I just kind of take back on c4, you guys will see this has never been played. Uh, this can get a little dangerous because of knight g4 and c5, and all of a sudden, even though I have the bishop pair, uh, tactically black is very very active. So instead, um, I play rook d1. So getting this tempo, he takes on b3, uh, then. Um, or knight fg4, maybe even, yeah. Um, and then after takes, my opponent goes queen b8. And uh, this has actually been seen before, kind of funny. Just two legends, me and Peter Stidler. So only the best play this line. And uh, this was kind of as far as uh, I remember, at least in my notes. Like I said, you know, I didn't check this before the game, but, um, you know, there are kind of keynotes 
that, uh, that I remember in my mind. So we get to this position and uh, you guys can see the, the, um, the compensation here is of course that I have the dark star Bishop shooting at the King, but uh, all I kind of remembered was, okay, I, the computer says it's like, you know, equal. Um, I have the Bishop pair and, you know, I, I'm sure I'll figure this out. So he goes C5. Uh, I play queen to f5, and now he goes uh, bishop to c6 just to cover uh, the back rank potentially, and also the seventh rank. And okay, you know we had a big speech about all sorts of different preparation, but at this point, um, for me, I was finally on my own. Now the unfortunate thing was, even though I had this position like kind of in in my notes um, during the game, I was actually spending a decent amount of time because I was like, hmm, I don't like like for example, if I just go back a little bit, when we had like this position. You know, sometimes when you look through things in your notes, you just kind of like go through them quickly. And that's kind of what I did. And then during the game, I was like, wait a second, what if he goes here? What if he goes there? What if he does this? So I was like thinking about all these questions because I wasn't like, uh, you know, I have been, it was the first time I was actually playing the position. So um, I was really taking my time, which was maybe we'll see, maybe not the best idea. Maybe I should just kind of, okay, whatever. It's in my notes. Let me just blitz everything because, you know, time becomes a, a factor later in this game. Okay. First big question for you guys. Let me pull up the world famous timer on the screen. Um, all right, uh, white to play. Uh, what would you guys do? We got, um, you know, we're out of the opening, down a pawn, got the bishops. He's consolidating, he just made bishop c6. I don't wanna lose. Let's, uh, let's see what you guys got. All right, so, Big answer reveals. Not yet. Okay, so there's been one move that a lot of people have sent in, and uh, I'm sure almost everyone considered, is the move f4. So very, very forcing move here. So very tempting to look at. And uh, most people just wrote knight g6, bishop c4, right? So it looks very active. You play f4, but you kick the knight back. You get pressure in f7. Looks, looks like a good time. Uh, okay, I, I, F4 is not the move that I played in the game. F4 is one of the top moves of the uh, of the computer as well. Um, gives two moves that are um, quite good. And uh, but the thing is with playing this F4 method after Bishop C4. Okay, let's say I play Queen C7 because no one really wrote this far. People were like, oh, F4 Bishop C4. I get all these attacks and whatever. And this is uh, you know this is uh, to kind of force for Black. You know, Queen goes to C7. I'm going to protect my pawn. And, uh, you know, black is threatening to play bishop e4, right? Uh, maybe, yeah, someone wrote bishop g2, maybe even bishop g2 ideas, right? Uh, but f4, even though it's aggressive, was, it also, um, you know, you created some kind of potential long-term weaknesses, right? You look at e3 and, and e4, so you need to really follow this up uh, energetically. So uh, the computer actually goes for this line, but it gives a really, like I said, energetic move here. It goes for rook to d6 in this position. So I actually didn't uh, didn't really see this. I didn't consider this that far. And um, um, okay, so Rio said he put he put uh, King F two. But after King F two, okay, like maybe Queen E seven. Just I can continue continue uh, consolidating. Okay, I got to be a little careful with Bishop before, right? Because there was maybe some Rook D seven stuff. But um, yeah, Queen goes C seven. I don't know. Looks a little a little suspicious. But um, yeah, the computer says you go Rook D six here, and then it like goes for this line Bishop E four, and then Queen D seven. And things go into this end game where, um, or potentially could go into this end game where white has enough compensation. I didn't actually see rib d6 though, um, but I was a little wary of playing f4 because, you know, I didn't really see this follow up. And I was, you know, okay, look, you know, I'm, I'm playing very forcing moves, but I'm giving my opponent pretty easy moves as well. And I'm not sure, you know, it looks like I have the initiative for one and a half moves, but then what's my follow up? So instead, I actually played something different. I'm going to get a couple of people who wrote, uh, wrote this down. I'll call in Austin though, and uh, Austin will explain to us the big idea that he had. Trying to. Hello. So my idea was h4, and I just want to march up the h pawn to open that diagonal for that bishop. So he's probably going to play h6 to prevent it. But now the difference is after f4, and then the knight moves. Uh, I think bishop d3, bishop c4, they both look good. But now h5 is a threat, uh, and then the knight will have to move again. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I know we had, like I said, there were multiple people with that, with, uh, with that idea. So, you know, I can't call them everyone at once, but, um, yeah, H4. And again, the computer rates F H4 and F4 the same, but to me, I actually played H4 here relatively quickly. 
And um, I was actually really happy when I spotted the idea too, uh, because it's it's uh, it's so simple. You know, you're just kind of like the thing is we're down a pond, right? So it's it's tempting to be like, okay, let's make something happen right now. But this is a very long term asset, right? These these two these two uh, long range guys over here. So with H4 now it's okay, very simple. You know, I'm gonna march this pawn down, and uh, yeah, if he does play H6, then that creates a lot more problems uh, on the light squares. You know, even something simple like that knight potentially hanging on G6 after the pit. So yeah, I played H4. Uh, what's this question? Uh, okay, was bishop c4 right away possible? I mean, I didn't even consider it, right? Because once I kind of trade my bishop off like this, then I mean, you, I mean, that that was one of the key things for our compensation, right? Having the two bishops being able to chase this knight around. Um, okay, I have dark square pressure, but he's probably going to nullify it. Even playing a move like f6 is totally fine. In okay, maybe I don't have to do it right here, but at some point, just to block this bishop out. So yeah, h4, and the other thing I liked about it versus uh, playing f4 is that it's not forcing, right? It, it keeps uh, keeps the pressure more on the opponent, and he needs to figure out how he's going to uh, react. So he plays queen c7, I go h5, and he goes uh, queen e7. So his reaction is just he's consolidating. Now I play h6. So he never stopped me from doing it. So I was like, all right, we'll do it. Um, it's not very easy to deal with. Um, the computer was saying like something like he has to go f6 right away. Not an easy move to make, right? Because, okay, it's logical to counter counteract this bishop, but it's also a little spooky because you're you're weakening the king. So, again, not, not easy to play this for black at all. Pawn goes down to h6, he takes it. I go back to h3. So we're trying to make use of this uh, of this diagonal. And now he goes uh, queen f6. Okay, this is not... Um, uh, okay, well, well, we can... Sure, I wasn't planning to give this as a, as a puzzle, but why not? Uh, so he goes queen f6. This was his whole idea. Obviously, when I played h4, he wasn't like, hmm, I wonder what he's doing. I think my plan was very, uh, very obvious. Him, and this is the way he decided to deal with it. Okay, I'm going to take, I'd rather do that than playing h6. And I'm going to try to create this makeshift sort of fortress of sorts. And uh, yeah, and he, he went for this. All right, what, what do you guys got for me? Well, uh, don't need the seven or six minute. Let's go back to the trusty three minute timer. All right, so this is kind of a uh, funny position because I, yeah. all right, first of all, the obvious thing. If you go to f4 here, uh, which is the move, you know, oh, we win, well, yay. There's knight f3 check. This is the whole idea. And then queen f3 doesn't work because I just take back. And this rook is safe. Okay, if the rook was on d2, that, this would be a good line. Fortunately, it doesn't work. Um, so f4 right away is not working, uh, or at least not winning. Then another very common move here has been queen g3, right? So this makes a lot of sense. Hey, let's get this queen out of the way. Let's put pressure. The problem is your opponent's not going to go king h8 and walking into every possible pin. The problem is still this move uh, king to f8. And okay, you know the game. The game goes on. You're you're, you're not you're not uh, winning here with f4 because once again there's this knight f3 move. You don't lose either because you can take back with the pawn. Uh, you don't you don't take with the queen. But very complex. Both kings are open. Uh, so. Yeah, need, needs to be examined. So a lot of people, you know, had these moves very, very, very forcing. And that's the stuff, you know, when my opponent played for this position, he was also looking at all these forcing moves, right? He was probably looking, hey, you know, like what happens if, uh, you know, if f4, what happens if queen g3? Um, there's some obvious moves too. So when I got to this position, I was looking at all these different moves too. For example, uh, Rio message, he was saying bishop a1. I think I saw some other people go bishop a1. This looks like a smart move. You're like, okay, I defend my bishop, you know, now I'm really setting up this idea of f4. But Black has some annoying ideas. Like his whole point, like this, this took forever to bring his queen, but now he can keep going. There's queen g6, creating pressure uh, on g2. There's also ideas of like, you know, like for example, if king f1, there might be queen c2. You got to deal with some annoying stuff here. And then uh, there's also queen, uh, rook to d2 ideas. So this looks really clever because it's like, hey, if you go, uh, you know, there's no more knight f3. So I'm threatening f4. But again, he has this queen g6 move. Threatening knight of three. And then if you play, um, again, this queen potentially can invade. So I was looking at all these moves as well. And I was going, oh, man, this is like so genius, this queen of six. How can you do this? And um, again, the biggest issue, of course, is that he has this uh, knight of three check idea. And again, we're all looking for solutions to play a four. And then, okay, you know, it's uh, basically once you kind of figure out the rest of these moves aren't really working as much, it, it's actually f four. And that's just metaphor. So bishop e2 to prepare for. No, it's like, hey, f4 doesn't work. By the way, it's f4. No, it's bishop e2. So um, there's other moves like rook, uh, rook d2 and bishop a1. They they don't lose. 
But, uh, I, well, King H1 does lose. I, th I think I just saw someone say King H1. Then I take an F2. But, yeah, Bishop E2 just allows you. It's just kind of weird because this was something that my opponent obviously missed. I also missed it when we were going for this position. And then, um, you know, a lot of people also missed this as well. I think it's just because, well, okay, we're doing this in the context of a puzzle. But even in the context of the game, it's really tempting to just kind of throw yourself in all these forcing options. Um, but this, there, there's, there's something a long time ago that I, that I read um okay everyone kind of does this it's called like skimming method you don't want to just immediately jump into like one move you kind of want to look at you know maybe all the logical you know candidate moves three four five options really quickly being like okay f4 like what's happening there okay then f3 i can go over d2 i can go bishop a1 you know what's, what's the difference there okay queen g6 maybe and then it's like what are the other options so for me i was kind of like uh, i was going through the same thought process though um, you know, like at four with D2. And then I was like, wait a minute, like I, I'm focusing on all these moves. And, you know, then I saw I actually had Bishop E2. So actually after Bishop E2, F4 is such a serious threat. And I'm also controlling this F3 square that he actually just went back to E7, which is apparently the best move. Then I take an H6, then he plays F6. And um, okay, I was I was going to give you guys a chance to, to solve, solve something here, but I'd rather save it for the next game. I just want to kind of explain what happened here. So, um, Okay, at this point, I was like, all right, I, I had maybe around like seven or eight minutes in the game. Uh, he had something similar. And uh, obviously, you know, when my opponent goes queen f6, queen e7, I was like, all right, this is, uh, this is, this looks like good stuff here. And um, so now I think, I, I remember, I think, like I said, I had six, you know, seven or eight minutes, roughly something like that. And I went down to two. So I put in, you know, the last kind of big thing sort of in this position because I was like, okay, this must be, um, must be winning, you know, this must be a winning position is, is what I was thinking. And, um, okay, there are some 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 obvious moves to cap it, right? Is there like bishop e5 and then bishop c4? Uh, you know, what is going on here? And uh, I'll show you guys, first of all, what, what uh, the, apparently the most precise win is, just because it's really cool. So I also looked at f4, f4 is, you know, very obvious. Like, hey, you know, what if I go f4 here, uh, chase this knight away so I can play bishop to f7, uh, excuse me, bishop to c4. And um, I was okay. He has to go knight g6 because otherwise, you know, this pawn on f6 is is uh, is is is, uh, is hanging. And when I saw this position, I was like, mm, okay, I'm not really sure what's going on here. I can give this check. He can go here. Looks really really lost here. But I was like, oh, there's this pressure on this uh, on this pawn. Wasn't completely sure what to do here. But it turns out I have this. Uh, I, this is what I missed. E4. And um, okay, obviously you can't take because of bishop f6. And if, uh, if Bishop takes, then it's like Rook D7 probably just wins. So this is, yeah, so there was definitely a forced win here. Unfortunately, I didn't see this. I didn't see this E4 move. And um, instead, I looked at Bishop to, to E5. Um, actually, I think in the game I played here first, which was a mistake, uh, because he could have actually taken, but he let me transpose back into this. So instead, this is actually, um, I'm sure you guys have heard this before. Uh, I even talked about this over a year ago. The problem is when you start running very low in time, uh, our, you know, we hyper-focus on the most forcing options. So to me, that was this. I'm like, okay, it takes, takes, let, let me go for this. And then I even played like, like you can see every move I play is like a threat. You know, every move I'm playing is like a forcing move. Uh, because, you know, when you start running low in time, you get two minutes, uh, you're like, okay, I need to be able to predict my opponent's responses. So you start automatically looking at, things that kind of make your task easier. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, that leads to us playing, you know, the most forcing moves, but not exactly the best moves. Okay, here actually, these were uh, the best moves. Um, these were, okay, the, the win, as I mentioned, was F4, but this was actually not a bad plan. The problem was when I got to this position, now I played E4, so I, uh, I get him tied down. He goes Queen G7. And uh, the problem is at this point, um, this is the other issue of running low in time. And I talked about this before. Unfortunately for me, that's a very common thing. I'm low in time. And almost every game I play, um, the issue becomes not only you know is your is your uh, you don't have enough time to think. Obviously, you also start thinking in certain negative ways, such as like I mentioned, only looking at the forcing options A and B. Um, you also start having I think a lot of people. I mean, certainly for me, uh, you start getting a lot more uh, aversion to danger, right? So you try to minimize all the risks because you're like, okay, I don't have time to calculate this. I'm going to try to play this like. Safely. By the way, in this position, the computer says my best move is really funny. And the game I played Queen H3. The computer says the best move is Queen H1. Um, I'm not sure why Queen H1 is better than Queen H2. I didn't really look into it. But the idea of both, this just looks really funny. Uh, I just want to mention it. But the idea of both of these moves is that the rook can swing over to H3. So what I should have been doing here is like, okay, I'm down this pawn, but it doesn't matter, right? Like, because these guys are not moving anywhere anytime soon. In the meantime, all the play is fixating on the king side. 
But like, as I mentioned, that's the other issue. When you're low in time or your opponent is low in time, that's also something important to consider. They're going to have most likely, or you're going to have a lot more, you know, risk, uh, risk aversion. And uh, to me, I, you know, I was like, oh man, like I, I got to be a little careful here because I don't want to have my initiative, you know, peter out and then I'm just playing down a punt. So what ends up happening is that, you know, I do a terrible job of, of putting pressure on him and he consolidates. And um, eventually what happens is like, um, I trade the pieces down. Um, I think around here even, yeah, this is still obviously a better position for me, but um, okay, he's doing a, he's, he's doing a better job in his, uh, in his consolidation. And um, okay, we end up just kind of getting into a draw and end game. So um, yeah, kind of a very uh, anticlimactic finish. Just kind of like, oh, here's my advantage and built it all up. Okay, here, here's a draw. It, it, it's all good. Um, and of course, that's a, that's a major issue for anyone um, who's you know ever been in a in low time situations. You just kind of um, you can't play as well, you know, with low time as you as you can with uh, you know. That's that's pretty obvious. The, the less obvious thing is how, how how do you avoid that? So yeah, going back here, obviously we had a quite quite a you know long uh, discussion about different types of you know things to to focus on in preparation from um, you know choosing your openings and you know resources to um, uh, you know also predicting what the opponents are going to play, having a look at lines that you know are critical, critical as in recommended you know in popular theoretical manuals. Um, that score well, that are, you know, simply make a lot of sense. Like sometimes I'll look at a position, I'm like, what if black goes here? Like, what if white goes here? This looks pretty obvious. And uh, the move might not be like very popular, but if it looks obvious to me, I'll usually have a look. And, uh, you know, because if I'm thinking about it, it could be something that my opponent plays as well. So um, yeah, right here, I thought this was, a, this was a pretty nice moment. And for all of you guys who played H4, um, you know, I think uh, that, that that's a kind of good idea to keep in mind, just kind of slowly. Someone mentioned it, like they were like, oh, slow, the art of improving your position or something like that, or slowly improving it. I'm sure that was some topic someone covered at some point or another. Um, yeah, that's 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 a worthwhile skill to have. Uh, and something that one of my coaches a long time ago also told me, he, um, uh, he was telling me about this concept. It, it was funny. He called it uh, tennis. He was like, yeah, you know, I play a lot of tennis during my chess game. I, um, you know, I, I like to hit the ball back into my, I always like that actually, that kind of analogy. He's, you know, if I'm not sure what to do, I'm going to play like a small improving move or like quickly and then just kind of give them, you know, give them the move back. You know, it's like, okay, here, I improve my position. Here, you 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 go mess something up. Obviously, you don't always want to be doing this. It depends on the type of position. But I thought this was like a pretty good application here. Again, you know, my, my pieces are almost as good as they can be. Um, you know, F4 is definitely something to look at, but okay, it's even though it's a forcing move, it doesn't really lead us to where we want to be. And then a move like H4, you know, again, like he, like I said, if we if we turn on, you know, e evals, like the computer is not saying that he's losing here. Uh, the computer is saying he's fine. But, um, you know, he has to find this F6 move, right? And uh, apparently, and he plays Queen C7, again, very lo logical. Again, I can play F4, I can play H5, I just decided to go H H5. And uh, yeah, even, and then here, this is a very difficult choice. Um, apparently G6 is stronger. I mean, it's it's like, Again, obviously, this is a big success for, for, for white here. If you, our opponent has to go G6, they're always going to permanently have these darts for weaknesses deep in the end game too. So, um, um, yeah, that, that's kind of a – yeah. All right, so it takes here, and then he makes another mistake, and then we're winning. Don't win the game, but, uh, you know, that's why, that's why I'm an I am an I am. You know, I can get the winning positions, but I can't win them. Uh, I'll, we have a question here that I'll, I'll answer before we move on and probably get to cover one more game. Um, do you think it's worth switching up your whole repertoire to dodge opponent's preparation? For example, if I'm an Italian player, I see my opponent plays a bad line as a Lopez, start switch playing that line, even though it's like Lopez. Okay, uh, the first that's two different questions, I would say. So switching up your whole repertoire to dodge opponent's preparation is, I mean, not advisable, generally speak, uh, speaking, because you know, you're saying, okay, look, if I'm worried about something they play, you know, what if I change my entire line just for that one game, short notice? You know, that, that's very risky because, um, I mean, you know, there is, it could work. I'm not saying you're never going to be successful with it, but obviously it's very difficult. You can't, it's very difficult to learn. I mean, it, it depends. Is it a new sub variation, right? And that those things come into play. Um, you know, you can change your variation. You can't change your whole opening. You know, if you've never played, for example, the Rui Lopez and you always play Italian, then, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be able to do it uh, just like that. There have been situations though, where you can see like, Hey, my, this guy, always plays this one variation and it's tempting to go for it. Um, you know, th that could be possible. I've definitely seen, or, you know, even done some kind of, uh, uh, something like that where you kind of try to target your opponent in one specific line, but you know, it obviously comes with risks because 
if your opponent's also preparing for you, they'll know like, wait a second, why is this guy playing this line that they never play? You know, like, and you also should keep that in mind too. If you prep someone, you see they play, you know, they always play the, you know, the French defense, 150 games in the French. And then all of a sudden you come to the board and they play something different. You got to be like, okay, you know, probably there is uh, might be something coming now. Okay. You don't have to freak out. You know, at the end of the day, you still have a whole chess game to play, but yeah, to answer the original questions, of course, you know, it's hopefully, you know, you, you don't switch your entire opening before, you know, an hour before the round. Uh, hopefully you have some other options you've, you've prepared. And um, obviously if you change something to directly target someone's preparation, hopefully you also know something there as well in case they deviate. Um, because that, that could very well happen and you could, you know, you could trick yourself uh, more than you're tricking your opponent. So most of the preparation, of course, has to be done before you're, you're at the tournament, uh, any tournament you're playing, whether it's round robin or Swiss or quads or I don't know, anything, anything at all, because, um, you know, that, that, that's, what, uh, that's what preparation is. You know, you can't really change too many things on the fly like that. Um, but, you know, okay, so if you, but if you have an event, you know, you know everyone's pairings, you know the pairings in advance, things like that. Um, like Austin saying he's prepping for his first AM event, you have to keep in mind that when you're prepping for players, they're also prepping for you. So it's kind of like this weird cat and mouse. Personally, what I do, I'll tell you guys what I do when I go into tournament. Uh, you know, even if I, I get my pairings in advance, I don't necessarily start doing these like, okay, like this guy in round three, this guy in round four, I'm going to come up with this huge massive novelty for these players. Generally what I'll do, I'll be like, okay, I have, let's say five whites and, you know, let's say I mostly play E4 and I'm seeing that a lot of my opponents are playing, you know, uh, e5 or c5 whatever usually you know i'll try to see what the general trend is are most of my opponents playing e4 or d4 and i'll have an idea I mean, okay you know if i i'm going to be like okay like looks like i have a lot of sicilians this tournament let me just kind of review all my ceiling lines let me see if i can you know there's some lines in my mind that i'll be like okay i don't know the sign that well i haven't had this line in a long time i'll just do very general preparation like that because most of the time if it's one of these events where people are preparing for each other your opponents are also looking at things so you know, they're also usually trying to surprise you, things like that. So I try, I actually don't really do too much targeted preparation uh, in general, just kind of focus on my own lines, you know, and uh, then also what you'll see is what happens in these tournaments, if you are specifically playing around Robin, is that, you know, things kind of change compared to round one to round six. For example, like by the time it gets round six, you know, you might, be, you might, you know, maybe you're in contention, maybe you need to, uh, you know, win your last three games or something like that. Or maybe, you know, your opponent is, is in that position. So the tournament standing also kind of determines the way people play. Some people need to play more aggressively. Some people, you'll also see that it's like, wait a second, this player who always plays the English is not playing the English at all or playing a different variation because people come to these events with, the, with new prep. So definitely I would suggest focusing more on, you know, specific uh, things in your, uh, excuse me, general things in your repertoire first. And then, you know, uh, of course, you know, it's, I'm not saying don't specifically prepare for someone either. Of course, it's also can be like, okay, you know, like this guy had this like idea for, but be fully prepared. You don't get to use it, but these ideas never go to waste because you could, if you don't get to use it in a, that game, you could use it, you know, in a future tournament or in a future game or things like that. So it's a, it's a tricky game. Basically, you know, the, the general answer is know your stuff. <laughs> if you, if you're, if you have enough time and you're strong enough, know more than your stuff, <laughs> know multiple variations. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of players I play who are grandmasters. They don't do any prep for their tournaments. They don't pre prep at all during the tournaments but they play so many things and they've been playing them for such a long time. You know, they can come to the board and they can play, you know, four different openings and uh, you know, they, they, it's, it's very hard to prep for them. And um, you know, they know their stuff and they, they kind of change it up. Okay. Sometimes they play into something that you might know better than this happens all the time too, but uh, you know, they have a lot of different weapons. That's what a lot of, I've noticed more and more nowadays, a lot of, a lot of players, they, you know, I think back, we used to be like, okay, I play this one thing. I'm going to play it for 25 years you know i'm gonna play it forever you know there's even players i'm sure everyone here knows if you go to like your local chess club and you're playing some of these players who've been there for a long time i've been you know I, i've been going to my local chess club you know since i was like seven years old and sometimes i can still play those players if i come back today they're playing the same opening they played back then but nowadays you know to be a strong player and um, you know to improve you definitely don't want to be doing that it's also not fun right you know when you play this game there's so many options you can do and you always do the same one it sounds a little bit boring uh, don't don't really recommend that. All right, let me show you guys one more. And I'll, I guess I uh, I always do this. I always prepare like four or five different things. And then we look at like one tenth of them. Um, let's see which one I'll pick. I'll pick this one. This game is a draw. I just I uh, have a loss that I have here, but I also have a win. Let's go with the win, right? That's more fun. Um, so let me pull this up. Okay, 
speaking of, um, this game was actually played um, also in the same tournament. Uh, my opponent is uh, is a grandmaster and um, used to be a very very strong player, uh, like top ten in the world. Not anymore. Uh, but let's see what it goes on. So e4, c5. Uh, by the way, this is also a guy who um, you know before the tournament I saw us playing him. Um, you know I saw he plays a lot of Cillian, but it wasn't clear which line. Like he plays like four different lines uh, in the uh, you know he can play some like Shivin again. He can play like you know Khan. Plays all these different lines. So, you know, it's what am I going to do? Am I going to like study every single one of those lines? Okay, I could do that. Um, but I uh, kind of before the event, I kind of reviewed the things more that uh, that I was like, okay, I don't remember this that well. And we reviewed this more. And when I came to the board, he played something that I didn't even look at at all. So this also happens quite often. So I played Bishop B5 check. This is what I normally play against this uh, Sicilian. He decides to play Knight C6. I'm sure there's some Bishop B5 players here. I'm sure there's some Sicilian players. Knight c6 here, you know, there's bishop d7, which is considered very solid. There's knight d7, which is like in the midway point. Almost everyone plays knight d7 nowadays. Haven't really seen a lot of knight c6s. This one is like maybe like the most combative because, you know, you don't block the bishop. Uh, you know, you keep your options to attack in the center, even with f5. So he decides to play this, you know, more aggressive way for whatever reason. Uh, castle, he goes bishop d7, rookie one. a6, a retreat. He goes e5. And we get this type of position, which is kind of like a mix between a Sicilian, uh, obviously we start with Sicilian, and uh, and the Rue Lopez, uh, right? You know, the very typical, you know, C3, D4 buildup uh, in E4, E5 positions. And uh, my opponent takes, takes, he goes Bishop G4, I play D5, Knight D4, Bishop E3, captures, captures, Bishop D7. Um, okay, so this was actually, uh, th this was actually, um, like I said, I didn't prep specifically for this game. Uh, I mean, I didn't have this specifically prepped for this game. Um, and this is actually all I knew from uh, from my uh, from my knowledge. Um, you know, this these specific moves. Um, and my opponent actually had. I don't think he actually uh, knew this. He was like kind of just playing on his own at this point. So uh, let's get some big speeches going. What do you guys think? You know, I'll make it very general. What do you guys think about the position? Um, plans from both sides. And um, what's your what's your evaluation? You guys, uh, you don't have to type it in. Just I'll call on some. Just type me if you want to be called on. Or I'll call him someone random. I'm calling Greg. I don't think he's here though. There's no me's I get to pick. That's perfect. Let's see who's here. Pick, 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 pick. Pick someone I've never heard from. Who hasn't typed anything either. So you're in danger if you haven't typed it. Let's go with let's go with Jenny. What do you think, Jenny? Plans for white, for black? What's your evaluation? All those wonderful questions. <laughs> Jenny said no. Uh, it's rough. How are you guys going to get participation points? You know, Greg is going to issue everyone a report card at the end of the class, you know? All right, who's this? Who's talking here? Uh... I'm gonna butcher your name. Help me out, Aradia. I'll call on you. Sure, you can call me Addy. So, but hey, anyway, uh, so I was thinking for like White should play like probably like um like a four with the idea of just like F take uh E five. So like that should, like that's like the main plan I would say. And of course, like Black's probably gonna try to stop that. Which I was thinking like Knight H five and then like Knight F four to stop that and then yeah i think the evaluation would probably be uh like why it's like slightly better um i don't know maybe actually a lot but okay all right so we got a brave soul volunteering to answer here so um okay f4 this is looks pretty tempting i would say but i actually didn't really consider this plan at all um and the reason is okay so let's kind of draw the boundaries here. Obviously, this reminds us probably more than anything, maybe like a King's Indian type position, right? Because, you know, we have this chain. Um, Black has 
I think Black's plays obviously should be on the king side. Uh, you know, we at Adi mentioned like knight h5 ideas to stop f4, but also just in general, like knight h5, f5, bringing this bishop to uh, to g5, things like that. So obviously, you know, these double pawns looks like, hey, you know, the king's in a lot of danger. But because we have the space advantage, we're really restricting a lot of these pieces, and particularly this bishop, right? This guy's quite bad. This is also giving us a lot of space on the uh, on the queen side here. So, you know, looking at my position here, I was like, okay, look, we're going to have a nice little party here on the, uh, on the, on the queen side. And, uh, you know, it's not so easy for black to get any kind of play going because again, these are ideas, you know, you could bring this out, but even if you get all these scary moves, like, you know, knight h5 and knight f4, and queen g5, you know, I put my king in h1 and, you know, this light square bishop, uh, obviously, you know, I can also like do some other stuff later, like maybe bring this rook in. It's not that easy for black to break through. So this type of position, I actually think is very, very, I think, I think the computer really likes it for white too. But I actually quite like it. I really, really liked it for, for white. And when we got this position on the board, I was like, okay, this is quite simple. I'm going to go all out on the queen side here. So first I played knight d2. Uh, the idea is just to develop, obviously, and target here. And now my opponent plays b5. Very, um, okay, like, what does he do, right? If he just plays knight, uh, if he plays bishop to uh, e7, you know, I can play knight c4 and try to invade. I can also maybe throw an a4 first. And, um, you know, again, it's like those king's Indian races where, you know, black kind of goes all out on the king side. But, you know, I'm really kind of, uh, crashing through here quite soon as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the best, best setup for me is. You know, I can put the bishop or knight there, uh, try to put the rook on the C file. Maybe queen can swing over even to A3 in some of these positions, create some pressure. But also I wasn't thinking of F4 at all because it looks very clearly like my play is on the queen side and I rather keep the central formation uh, solid. So again, this is, uh, you know, I'm sure this has been a topic uh, many, many of the USCS coaches did a million times and, um, you know, just kind of understanding the pawn structure. That's another important thing, whatever line you play, you know, again, this position here, if we look in the base, it's actually been reached, you know, relatively often. Um, and some really strong players, you know, you got a non here. So it's been breached 122 times. I don't really know this position super well, you know, when I went into it, but, you know, I knew these, these main ideas. So um, let's kind of look. Uh, yeah, 92 is played. There is also a four is a possible move. My opponent plays B5. And okay, very, you know, very committal because he's giving me a target, but he's also not letting my knight invade. So I go a4. What was the idea? Well, the idea here, he plays the move uh, bishop to um to e7. So he likes to keep the pawn on b5, right? I actually thought maybe he was going to consider taking here. Um, and I was okay, there's no way this works. You know, he can't just be opening up the entire queen side for me. So I just want to show you guys this idea in case um anyone, I mean, just just kind of give you something to use maybe in your own game at some point. I was going to play knight c4. Obviously, you know, there's a, if I get this light square bishop, this guy's going to dominate everything. So rook bait is forced. And speaking of getting rid of the light square bishop, I was just going to sacrifice here on a4. And uh, again, you know, uh, some players, uh, and me included when I was younger, I would say, you know, it's very kind of difficult to sacrifice material unless you get it immediately back. But here, it's like, it should be, I mean, we'll look at something a little concrete, but it should be so obvious that, you know, this guy is such an important piece for black, really his only good piece that even if we give up this rook and we dominate all these squares, it definitely should be enough compensation. So for example, if he takes, queen takes check, like queen d7, queen takes a6, okay, we already get the pawn back. And there's all sorts of stuff here. Obviously, this king is not safe at all. You go bishop b7, I go knight b6, queen b7, queen a4 check, for example, king has to go to f8. This king can't even get out. And, uh, you know, we probably can even win with the very simple plan of using this b pawn. So, um, yeah, this is very, very uh, bad for black. And he didn't do it. He was like, okay, that's obviously pretty bad. He goes um, rook uh, bishop to e7. And uh, okay, this makes sense. He wants to maintain the pawn, keep it from, uh, keep my piece from coming to g4, take on b5, queen b3. So pretty logical moves, opening up my rook, creating this target. We work uh, together, castle, live rook together. Rook c1, knight h5, takes, takes, rook c7, queen 8. Now, the funny thing about this game here, um, I didn't notice at the time, of course, uh, so we're actually following a decent amount of games. And um, castles, I play rook c1. This then h5 move, uh, not a novelty, but not the most common move. The most common move for black here has been h6. And I guess the idea is, you know, at some point, maybe the knight goes to h7, could maybe still go to h5, and black tries to really get rid of this bishop. Um, I think that's kind of the main idea. As you can see, the statistics are not very kind to black here, um, but we'll get something similar in the game. So he plays knight h5. Like I said, this has been played before, um, uh, 2016. Had no idea about that, though. So he goes knight h5, very, very logical. And this is something else that I want to kind of share with you guys. Um, when I was especially, uh, you know, I'm guessing the average rating here might be around like 2100 or so, uh, especially when I was that rating. So when I was around like 12 years old, um, I would, um, 
um, you know, if I was in this type of position for, for white, uh, I would definitely be freaking, freaking out a little bit because one of the things that I've always found, um, and even now, like that's also kind of scary. I always found it very annoying when my opponent kind of is attacking my king, right? Cause it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to get checkmate. So when you, you know, this whole position here, when he goes like net h5, it looks like black has a very, very obvious plan, right? You know, he's going to go f5, he's going to go net f4, so aggressive. And um, the nice thing was, you know, that now that I'm a bit older compared to when I was like 12, when I was looking at this position, I actually did not think I was going to get checkmated at all because I was like, okay, first of all, I know I haven't done anything wrong in the opening, right? I know that I'm playing the right way um, that, uh, you know, it's supposed to be good for white. I know it's been played by many strong players. I know the computer likes it, but moreover than that, if I just kind of look past the opponent's aggressive moves, like meta four and F5, then it becomes very difficult to see, you know, what, okay, what then? What, if you get those pieces there, what's your next plan? Okay, rook F6, right? So you, black just needs like so many moves to get threads going here. So in the meantime, I already have all the files opened up on the queen side. So I was like, okay, logically speaking, this attack is too slow. So generally kind of speaking, there's this, you have to also, when you're being attacked, at least, you know, this was something that I learned over the years, is that, you know, you have to also keep it in perspective. Even if it looks scary, you have to kind of, you can't, okay, sometimes it's good to rely on your intuition, but very often you have to also think very specifically, very concretely. Okay, it looks scary, but, you know, let's look move by move. And now I was actually pretty proud of the calculation I did in this game because everything came forced. So I took, he took, I played rook c7, he plays queen e8. So very logically, he keeps his pawn defended, and he also tries to, you know, he brings this queen over here. Um, I would give this to you guys as a puzzle, but I'll just kind of share it, you know, since we're about to finish. So I play queen a3. So again, as I mentioned, my files are already open. I'm going to, you know, start slamming through on the queen side. He goes f5. Now I go queen a7. He goes net f6. So I'm not sure, but I think you might have missed this idea. And this is why I'm saying, you know, you want to be, you know, it's important to keep a cool head and look concretely at these positions. Because here it looks like, okay, you know, I put my rook and my queen on the seventh rank. You know, it looks like I'm not going anywhere. He's going to play, you know, F4 and I might bit or something, or maybe takes and this queen is coming. So it's starting to look scary and, and whatnot. But here there was a move that I'm pretty sure he missed. And that was the move pawn takes F5. And I saw this move um, quite far ahead, actually. Um, and it looks, you know, very stupid because, you know, this whole time we want to keep this chain together. But the point about uh, of this move is, first of all, you know, there's pressure on this pawn. There's, there's this idea of F4. And this just gets rid of that. Obviously, he can't take back because he's seven's hanging. And at the same time, I'm also opening up avenues for my pieces. Oh, by the way, bonus points. I also take away queen g6. So this solves three threats at once. Not a move that looks obvious at all, uh, especially, you know, from afar. You know, you're ruining the pawn structure. But this move really puts his position kind of this busts blacks all of his plans. And, you know, 94 is coming if this knight gets in. Very, very bad. Now, the game is not, I actually saw even past this because I thought his move was forced. He plays bishop to d8. I go rook b7, and now he takes an f5. So this position, I actually had seen, I think, roughly when I played, um, roughly from over here, when he played net h5. And I, yeah, roughly from here when I played rook a8. So it's pretty proud, actually, of, like, this, this calculation. But these are surprisingly, I think, the best moves for white and black, uh, pretty surprisingly. And, um, yeah, what happened here, he gave me this pawn. And here's something, something a little funny that I'll reveal to you guys. Remember I said there was a game that was played before uh, in this position? Well, apparently that game got to this position. That game went to, to move 26. So as you guys see, chess base automatically <laughs> annotated the game. I played a novelty in move 26. It wasn't prepared novelty. I wish I could be like, yep, I beat this guy, this grandmaster, you know, 26 moves of preparation. No, I, I found most of these moves at the board. But uh, if we kind of go back, when you played knight h5 here, uh, this was this is where me and this game, we, we kind of... These, we were the only two games to play. And, um, you know, these moves were kind of, um, that was our notation. Um, these moves were kind of uh, straightforward for both sides. So anyway, I'll show you guys the finish here. Take stakes. I took bishop h6. And my novelty here was the very brilliant rook g2, retreating the rook. Um, so I'm up a pawn. It's not a very impressive pawn, but that's not my main advantage. My main advantage is that, is that remember, my opponent was trying to attack me. He's not attacking me at all. I got all, everything covered. And it's your king that's getting attacked. And also you always, you kept these long-term weaknesses. So that's why, you know, like, for example, if any Kings Indian players here for white or black, you know, in the Kings Indian, there's a lot of positions where black goes all out. And if you don't mate on the King side, you get wrecked on the Queen side and you can even go into end games where you still get wrecked on the Queen side. And that's kind of what happened here. Rook G8, Queen B8. And um, I won another pawn and he tried to like simplify it. And now I'm up three pawns. Uh, and then he, we, we got into this opposite color Bishop game. He ended up actually resigning somewhere here. Uh, he should have actually played it out. Um, he would, you know, he was just yeah, down three pawns. It's kind of a weird position because uh, 
this bishop can kind of just sit here and do nothing. Like, you know, he, he like resigned. He was like, all right, whatever, this is losing. But uh, the win here is actually, um, okay, I would have won, but it takes a while. There's like some wins where I basically zogs along him by moving the king around. I would have played the song. I thought it was a little weird he resigned, but okay, he's lost. Um, so, so that's that. Anyway, um, again, you know, I thought, um, if I just want to sum up what kind of happened here. Yeah, I thought this type of uh, opening position was interesting in general. Um, and uh, also one of the things that um, I think I began understanding at a better level, at least, and something that my some of my coaches at the time were always preaching to me when I was younger, was, you know, they really kind of taught me the value of having more space. And I think that's why in, in nowadays in a, in a lot of different uh, openings and variations, you see all these lines where, you know, white just kind of plays for some space advantage. And uh, here, you know, this is even a good idea, even though my pawns are all doubled up. Let's see what the, um, you know, what the evaluation here says. Yeah, the computer is kind of giving, you know, 0.7 or something like that. So very favorable position for white. Uh, looks kind of spooky, but that's kind of the advancements that we have, uh, you know, in, in our understanding, uh, especially with some of these engines. So yeah, plan here was very straightforward. You know, just go attack on the queen side. Um, then again, dealing with the opponent's pressure. You know, he was, he has this very spooky attack, but it turns out, you know, with the cool defense, just doesn't work. And uh, this was also kind of the problem for my opponent. He didn't realize his, how bad his position was until almost until after the game ended. You know, I, I talked to him a lot about the game because it looks like Black's moves are just so obvious. It's like, oh, this is so brilliant. You know, Black just kind of positions all these pieces here and checkmates white, you know. So he was actually playing all his moves very quickly, very confidently. Um, you know, he wasn't really calculating because he was just kind of playing by hand, as they call it, by feel, you know, he's using his like experience and, you know, just the moves for black look really obvious. But the truth is, you know, I was actually never really particularly worried in this game because the space advantage, the fact that, you know, it takes him like six moves to create a threat here um, makes it uh, makes it very difficult. All right. So I want to share, you know, I have some different stuff that I want to share with you guys, just kind of some games from my recent tournament practice. Um, don't worry, I had a couple of losses I wanted to show, but, you know, so so, uh, you know, didn't get around to them today, but I do owe you guys a couple more lessons. So I'll be back in the future. Hopefully we'll, um, you know, get to them and other, other interesting adventures. And uh, hopefully, yeah, some of these positions were interesting to you, you know, regardless if you play them or don't, um, you know, hopefully you picked up some ideas. Uh, hopefully, you know, I answered some of your questions about preparation. And um, uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we're going to be wrapping up. Keep going. Well, you know, I could keep going. I just don't want to, but I will see you guys soon. Any last second questions, I'll try to answer. Otherwise, you guys are free to go. Well, you guys are always free to go, actually, but now you're really free to go.